Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today for our public forum on hurricane-resistant construction for householders. I am Barbara Carby, the director of the Disaster Risk Reduction Center here at UWI. And we are pleased to partner with the Jamaica Institution of Engineers, Jamaica National, and UWI TV in putting on this forum, which I hope you will find very informative and very interesting. Now, wh why are we having this forum? As it happens, I have been involved in looking at responses to some of the very recent and tragic events in the region in terms of hurricanes. So, you know, since 2017, including 2017, we have had several Category 5 storms which have done extreme damage to many of our Caribbean territories. And as I went through the region, the question that kept popping up was, can one design and construct a small building to withstand a Category 5 hurricane? And many householders were concerned about this, and justifiably so, because as the climate scientists tell us, we can expect more intense storms under climate change scenarios as we go forward. So it means that we, we will, in fact, I think, eventually have to revisit our codes to take into account this reality. But very important, I think homeowners need to be armed with the basic information they need to be able to police repairs to or construction of their own homes. So this is the background to this forum. Now, when we, when we have a disaster, as we call it, very often all we are seeing are pictures of destruction, damage and extreme destruction. Of course, that grabs the attention and that is the media focus. Very often, however, buildings do survive these extreme events. We don't pay enough attention to those buildings which have survived because certainly the ones that have survived are the ones that we should be trying to replicate, okay? So when we're going to build back, we build back better, we build back stronger, and we look at the, the positives and the strengths of those structures which survived. So this is from Dominica 2017. You will see, based on the amount of debris that has been deposited there, that a fair volume of water passed through the street. Huh? But you see, the buildings are standing up. Look at the roofs of the buildings. Those roofs are largely intact. There has been some stripping of the cladding that you will see, but really, the, structure, the structures there are still very much usable. The buildings have retained their functionality. Sure, you will have some water damage inside and so on, but essentially, you still have a shelter. Now, this one I find really interesting, and I'm sure the, the engineers could probably tell us something about this. Two wooden buildings side by side, one completely demolished, the other one has actually survived intact. So that surely must speak to some elements of design and construction. And then, this is actually one of my favorite pictures. This is a picture out of the US. And one building has survived the storm surge, showing that it really is possible to design and construct structures which can stand up. So today, we have a very distinguished panel of presenters who will guide us through some of the information that we need to know to achieve this kind of resistance in our buildings. Before we go to the panel, however, we do have some greetings. First, we have greetings from Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, 
the Vice Chancellor of UWI. Sir Hillary could not be here with us. Uh, we are having graduation actually exercises on the other campuses and he has to be traveling. But he did send a greeting which will be read to us by Mr. Ian Forrest of the Office of the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs. One of the things I've come to appreciate uh, being in the Office of the Pro Vice Chancellor is that hands can be laid on you suddenly. And um, as I interact with people in the resilience business, um, certainly preparedness is uh, key to how it is we do. Uh, I speak on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, as uh, Dr. Kabi has pointed out. He says, my warmest congratulations and sincere thanks to the Disaster Risk Reduction Center and partners, the Jamaica Institution of Engineers and the Jamaica National for collaborating in hosting this public forum on hurricane resistance for householders. In 2017, Build Back Better became a rallying call in the Caribbean in the wake of the devastation brought by hurricanes Irma and Maria in Dominica and Barbuda. The message had hardly started to take root before the 2019 hurricane season, which is still not over, brought Hurricane Dorian to the Bahamas and the region witnessed again the devastating power of a Category 5 storm. Attention to the increased intensity of these storms is of critical importance for governments and other stakeholders as consideration has to be given to how infrastructure can be constructed in the future to withstand ever stronger winds. I led a team to the Bahamas to assess the extent of the damage to homes and businesses. And as it was in Dominica in 2017 and Barbuda as well, witnessing the stark evidence of what homes had been reduced to, mere rubble and flotsam, has reinforced my commitment of bringing the collective expertise of the University of the West Indies to bear on helping our region to build back better. The UA has been engaged in research and advocacy on climate change for many years. In 2018, we were invited by the International Association of Universities to lead a global consortium of universities to conduct research and lead advocacy in addressing these complex challenges in its many manifestations. In July this year, the UA hosted the inaugural meeting of the Commonwealth Caribbean Climate Change Resilience Network, and in September 2019, we coordinated with the State University of New York the first ever Global Youth Summit on Climate Change, recognizing the role of the youth in addressing the challenge of climate change. Also in 2019, the UA was the location for the second Tourism Resilience Summit of the Americas that brought together partners from academia, industry, and government. The summit recognized the impact of climate change on the global tourism sector and heard strategies to support this critical economic sector. This forum is another element in that unfolding strategy. It impacts directly on homes and how the people of the Caribbean can build to withstand the power of increasingly stronger hurricanes. My best wishes for an engaging and fruitful forum. Blessings, Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor. Thank you. And now, on behalf of the Honorable Earl Jarrett, I ask Mr. Curtis Martin, Managing Director of Jamaica National Bank, to bring greetings. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Barbara Carby, Director, Disaster Reduction Center, fellow panelists, Dr. Richard Clark, Senior Lecturer, Department of Civil Engineer, Mr. Christopher Lou, renowned architect, Mr. Chris Hamilton, President of GIE, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. The Jamaica National Group is pleased to be part of this conversation on hurricane resistance for householders, given the heightened risk our island state faces from these natural occurrences due to climate change. The JN Group sees itself as an institution for development and, therefore, our support for this event goes beyond financing and extends to a deep interest in how we can improve the lives of people by empowering them to manage their environment and mitigate the effects of disasters 
that will only serve to erode their independence. Hurricanes, as evidence year after year, are no longer once in a lifetime occurrences for us in the Caribbean, but are storms which are occurring more frequently and appear to be much more powerful in nature than they once were. It is therefore important for us to equip our people with the skill set and the mindset to survive these new realities as part of our growth strategy, given the costly consequences of these events and the ability to disrupt and undermine economic growth. I wish to commend Dr. Barbara Carby and her team here at the UWI for mounting, discussion, mounting this discussion this evening. We know Dr. Carby has had a long history as an advocate for disaster preparedness, having previously served as Director General of the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, and now as a Director for Disaster Risk Reduction here at the UWI. She has had some successes in changing the narrative and bringing some core issues to the fore during the course of her career, but there's much more for us to collectively much more, much more for us to do collectively to support the cause to make disaster planning an everyday mindset and not merely a response to an event. I am therefore looking forward to the exchanges that we will have during this public forum that will follow this opening segment and to the ideas and thoughts that will be generated to further empower our citizens and strengthen our resistance. Once again, thank you for including Jamaica National in this conversation. It is our hope that through our brand and our contribution today, we'll also add value and promote greater consciousness and awareness regarding the issues being heard today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks to technology, we're no longer limited to have our presenters in person, face to face and in person with us. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. And we will start with Dr. Richard Clark, who is in St. Augustine at the UWI campus there. Uh, Dr. Clark is an engineer and he's one of our presenters. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Richard Clark. I am of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering of the Faculty of Engineering, St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies. Thank you, Dr. Clark. We also have with us a representative from the Institute of Architects, Mr. Christopher Liu. Mr. Liu? Thank you. Then we have Mr. Len Kelly from the Incorporated Master Builders Association of Jamaica. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am the, currently the president of the Incorporated Master Builders Association of Jamaica, um, which is the organization of the larger local um, construction companies. Um, tonight, we'll have a look at um, the, the somewhat of the history of um, some of our hurricanes and how we really approach um, the construction going forward. And certainly looking forward to hear the questions um, and some responses regarding whether we can really design to withstand uh, a cat type hurricane. Thank you. And we have also Mr. Martin, from whom you heard before. He's also a panelist, so he's actually double hatting today. Okay, so Curtis Martin, managing director of JN Bank. Uh, Jamaica National has a partner in the seminar. JN 
Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we're going to go uh, straight into our presentations now. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Lou. I'm after no again. I don't have a PowerPoint. There is a document that was produced in 1989, post-Hurricane Gilbert. There is a PDF of it, which I'm sure it will be emailed to you since all of you have given us your email. It was a document produced by the Construction Resource Development Council a center rather, CRDC, and was reprinted in 2000 and by the CIC, of which the master builders, architects, engineers, land surveyors, land economy evaluators, and planners, and land surveyors are members. Now, this document, well, unfortunately, the PDF is really f what you call formatted for printing a booklet, which is what this is. But it speaks generally about what the, um, outcomes of the studies that were done post-Gilbert, and it was discovered, or it was quite evident, that roof failure was a major issue. I think our mandate here is to discuss small homes, and how can you make your home that exists less vulnerable, and if you're constructing a home, how to make it more disaster resilient. So that is addressed clearly in the booklet regarding the roof, the wall plate and the connections, rafters and, and the ridge board, roof sheeting, shingles and lads. So it's all there in the booklet. There are diagrams. It was what you could say is a user-friendly booklet for the general person, not a technically overstressed booklet. When 19 or 1988-89, we were still an imperial country, so everything is still in foot and inch. But I do not believe that those that information is no longer relevant. What the booklet speaks to is that Overhangs are, make your roof vulnerable to uplift. And so therefore, it references, there's another study done post Gilbert in the Virgin Islands, which speaks the vernacular architecture of the Caribbean. And it mentions that the hip roof with no overhangs is the best type of roof to withstand a hurricane. It also speaks of the 30 degree slope for the pitch of your roof. And it also makes mention that as the design of buildings in the region evolved, and you can see it in the great houses, that you had these verandas that went around the building. And if you do have a house with a veranda, the veranda roof should not be tied to the main roof. So in the event of uplift, the main roof is not destroyed, and the veranda roof might be destroyed, but the main roof is intact. There's a small diagram here that shows the wind pattern with that type of roof versus a more modern roof which has a gable end and does a, a mono ridge. But as I said, those are, those are this information. I think the situation we have in Jamaica is that there are two sets of homeowners in Jamaica. No, there are three sets of people. Those who create shelter for themselves with limited means, maybe do not have land tenure, there are those who are contributors to NHT or are able to access an NHT constructed house or open market loan to build on own land or buy on the open market from a developer. Then there are those who have the financial wherewithal to build their own dream house. Retrofitting your existing house, whether it be a dream house on Smoky Vale or overlooking Meadowbrook and Havendale or Beverly Hills or someplace out in the hinterland of this country where you can't even see the house because your expansive estate is so large. There, there is the fact that um, you have windows, you have doors, you have a roof, you have walls, you can put on hurricane shutters or screens like sunscreens that you can retract and become shutters in a way. I, th I think you have seen it when people have a house and they try to retrofit it and the shutters kind of destroy the aesthetic of their home. So I guess what you need to do if you have a home and you wish to um, make it more resilient within your budget is to investigate 
Oracle, what you call impact-resistant windows. I won't call the name of a company that claims if a burglar is hammering it, it will withstand that. <laughs> there, are, there are window manufacturers in Jamaica who post Hurricane Allen and the Florida building codes, and they are impact-resistant. Um, one 50 mile per hour projectile hitting the glass of the window. So people have um, windows that they have test results for, so that's an option for you. Then there's the doors. But the, it, that, that is retrofitting the existing home and the shutters and the roof. There's a recommendation that metal standing seam roofs of, of a certain pitch, I mentioned at 30 degrees, seem to stand up better. But we have seen shingle roofs, properly constructed buildings, withstand hurricanes. We have fortunately not experienced what the Bahamas experienced recently, so we do not know how resilient our environment is to a stressful situation of days of prolonged rain, storm surge, and wind. That brings us to the reality of Jamaica, that in 1988, we were focused on certain things. Post-1988 and now 2019, climate change, Tidal surge, Hurricane Ivan and Caribbean Terrace, Rocky Point, Clarendon, those are examples of what can occur. There's also land slippage, and I see the engineer in the room. There's a hillside development policy on guidelines for building on slopes in Jamaica. Geology, that brings us to kind of expansive, speaking of a national spatial plan and knowing the safe areas that one can build if you are buying a lot of land or developer contemplates doing housing. There's an infamous scheme, Nightingale Grove. It is known it was built on a sinkhole and flooding occurred and the people's homes were up to the eaves underwater. If you are a homeowner, you need to know that the development you are buying into has incorporated in the design some level of disaster resilience. I'm sure Jamaica National will give you a better premium knowing that that is so. Correct, sir? <laughs> no, no, it, no. There is also a very serious factor about building in flood-prone areas. And we know of a large bedroom community across the waters. And there are maps that show. And remember, days gone by when a hurricane was coming, people will be evacuated to the national arena. That doesn't happen anymore. But why were they being evacuated? When tropical storm before it became superstorm Sandy was coming from the south, I think we were all very worried that this was the perfect storm coming directly into Kingston Harbor from the south and pushing the surge of over 15 feet into the harbor. We escaped. Haiti did not escape. New Jersey and the Bahamas did not escape and parts of Cuba. So we have been very blessed and we have not been tested. So, as I said, everything comes at a cost. We're talking about making your current home resilient. If you are going to build a new home, then the design of the home is critical. Same thing we're speaking of, the pitch of the roof, the materials you select, the windows you select, the orientation of your home in relation to prevailing winds. If you are building on an elevated site, you know from Gilbert that in Stony Hill and other areas, the gusts were much stronger than on the Ligony Plain. So your house has to respond to the stress it is going to be under, given its location and elevation. Strangely enough, from the Gilbert scenario, Mandeville was spared and sections of Jamaica had very little damage compared to other areas. Hanover, remember? The hospital in Hanover, Princess Margaret in St. Thomas were devastated. Sections of Galena and St. Mary. So it is strange how this eye that passed over the totality of Jamaica did not impact sections of it the same way. That history and history of Ivan Dean and every storm that has passed and hurricane that has impacted Jamaica Probably Dr. Carby and the team have that data and looked and studied it and in its impact on structures. We, have not, we are speaking about homes, but you realize that what occurred in Gilbert is that commercial buildings that might be near homes, glass, storefronts were flying, and that can impact a neighbor who has a home. So this disaster resilience is not isolated to homes, but to all buildings in Jamaica. 
I think Dr. Carby referenced the Building Code, the Building Act, and the whole system of design, approval, inspection, and enforcement to ensure compliance with the codes. That is critical. The fact and reality of it is that most Jamaicans do not understand or see the benefit of these codes. I think that is where there is a major thrust that has to occur, and this is a beginning of it. I'm expecting to see much more happening from the local government and community development ministry, JCIF, and other entities. I mentioned earlier that the World Bank has been working with Jamaica. One of the plans is that JCIF will be rolling out an education program going into deep rural Jamaica, if there is such a thing anymore, to train tradesmen in sustainable disaster resilient construction methodologies, building upon the skills they already have. So if you, I don't think any of you have a little house in Petersfield, in West Berlin or wherever, you're going to buy a little wood house from a tradesman and he's going to erect it on your lot. But those people who have seen that as their housing option should have a tradesman who has more knowledge than he had in the past to site their house, as I said, to, to, to um, ensure that the prevailing winds are mitigated and when how he sites the house and his location in relation to trees and blowing and breaking branches. So as I said, there is a vast topic and this little booklet gives a lot of information on basic nuts and bolts, really. It's really saying you don't nail down things, you bolt them down because Gilbert showed clearly the wind just ripped out the board and the nails were bent. So nails are not the way to fix a wall plate or a roof plate or a sole plate because remember, Jamaicans do, do still a lot of wood construction and the roof might stay on, but the whole building was lifted off its foundation. So I don't know if I've done my 15 minutes, but I think in the Q&A, we can all expand upon anything we have said today, and I hope you are going to ask us questions because it's through dialogue that we get more information from us, and you also can bring your own experiences. And I think there are resource persons in the audience who will do that for us very ably. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lou. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce Mr. Christopher Hamilton, who is the president of the Jamaica Institution of Engineers. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think Mr. Lou basically took you through the whole process of everything that you need to know about ensuring that your, your houses can withstand the category six, seven, eight, <laughs> right? Which means that he probably would have suggested that you, 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 you need to construct that, that house somewhere underground. Because considering the events that we've been having in the last couple of years, one wonders you know, whether one can really and truly consider that you've built a home that, that, that can withstand these, these elements. So the question today, how can we, how can a small building survive a category five hit? Basically, let's put it into perspective, the category five hurricane at some point, Gilbert was a Category 5. It hit Jamaica at Category 3. And for those who remember the experience, you'd consider that you could never imagine what a Category storm would, would feel like. So let's put it into perspective. The first slide shows you how many Category 5 hurricanes we've had over the, 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 you know, since they started mapping these hurricanes. But slide on, on your right basically puts it into perspective. So a category three, what you see in there, 120, what, nine miles per hour. And let's look on the category five, 157. Now, although we're talking about, you know, what, 20 plus miles difference in speed, we, we're talking about significantly, talking about catastrophic effect. Now, I don't want to know what that means. I don't know about you, but I don't want to experience what the catastrophic effect is. I can't even pronounce it, you know? But let us look on this. This is our cat chart, our puss chart, or whatever you'd want to call it. So category one, we have our 
lovely little feline there, basically, you know, enjoying the, 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 the breeze. And as we move progressively, you realize that, you know, you've lost. You've lost not only one cat, but starting with one, we end up losing two, right? So that's just basically to put it in perspective, that we, we, we're talking about wind speeds that would literally tear buildings off of their foundations, all right? Now, again, Hurricane Dorian, some of us would have seen the, the images of, of, of the damage that was experienced there. We're talking small islands, you know, not much different from our own, but the building construction methods there were quite different, right? Um, if, if I, I, I suppose out of our experience here, we would have taken on different methods and because of the, 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 the effects of all of these um, weather elements, we would have come up with different methods of construction that we consider safe. But what is happening? We're seeing bigger and greater storms, higher wind speeds, longer sustained gusts, um, and, and these are the elements that tear our buildings apart. Right, so Dorian, what we're looking on there is, you know, if you were to look on it initially, you'd wonder if it is the, the Riverton Dome, right? So if you look on it in real and true perspective, there we are talking about dwellings that have gone from something to literally nothing. And this is the effect of sheer wind speeds and how long Dorian sat over the Abaco Islands and so on, right? So. Yes, it is very possible that your structure can withstand the 157 miles per hour for a short period of time. But with prolonged exposure, um, you know, where, where the, the, the structure is continuously being weakened, we, we have to look at, well, basically put it in perspective. We ensure that our built systems need to be built to the best of quality. And, that is basically what we can do. So what do we do? We ensure that you know, you're, 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 you're going to start your home, you're going to add to it. You ensure that you're employing expertise that know what they're doing. So when, when, when the, the IMAJ president comes here, he'll suggest to you that what we want to do in Jamaica is to have the best set of tradesmen carrying out the best set of practices, being guided by our new building code and our new building practice, our new, newly trained and certified artisans, um, supervised by the best expertise. Right? But we all have a part to play in it. What it means is that when we're going out and employing those services to carry out the construction, we need to ensure that we are using qualified contractors, qualified tradesmen with the expertise so certified to carry out the best in the built structures that we want, all right? So again, before and after, all right? Now, for the, for the, the greatest part, what we're talking about here in terms of the categories Category five. We're really looking mostly on in terms of the wind speeds, but of course, of course, as um, Mr. Lou spoke about earlier, we're talking about um, flood-prone areas in Jamaica. We have a lot of those. Um, we're talking about the geology of the soil. So, will our will our foundation stand up? Will will we have landslides? Will we have land slippages? And progressively over the years, the powers that be have seen where there needs to be improvement in the quality, the standards, the information that the, the, the average person is able to access in terms of informing them how, where, when to build their homes. All right, so Mr. Lou spoke about Nightingale Grove. Now, um, when he mentioned it, I don't know if most of you really understood what he was talking about. You literally were seeing just the peaks of houses. Right, and that was all through water damage. We weren't talking about high winds or whatever. We're talking about water that is running from the plains, areas all around that come and settle at this point on the home that you have spent years saving, years making your contributions, and in one event, you know, you had to be 
basically on boats trying to get from your home to your neighbor's home. And that took how long before that water subsided? I mean, you know. So, and after which, what you need to do? You need to go in and try to salvage the home because, you know, you're talking about your life savings. So, the expectation is that the powers that be will carry out certain practices to help to protect the consumer. We're talking about flood pain mapping. We're talking about um, ensuring that the codes and standards are followed. We're talking about ensuring that when you submit your drawings and plans that are carried out by professionally qualified engineers, that when they are reviewed, they are reviewed to the, the quality standards that we expect moving forward. And at the end of the day, that they are built by contractors such represented here by the IMAJ that are of the highest quality and highest integrity in carrying out those works. All right, so we talk about the small home. What we're talking about, this is typically what we're looking on. We're looking on, this is a, a, a scheme home somewhere probably in the Clarendon, probably in the same plains that Mr. Lou spoke about. Right? Um, if you notice, it doesn't have pontoons at the lower area, so it's not going to float. Um, it, what, so what it means is if, if this is in a flood-prone area, then you know, it's going to, to sit there and it's going to receive all the waters from wherever it is. But more importantly, let's talk about the effects of the, of, of, of the wind on, on our structure. Right? So that structure looks like it is well-built. Eh? But what does look like it's well-built mean? It mean that it's properly painted and the trims look are nicely painted and um, you know the shingle is of the style that you know your 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 neighbors might envy, but that means nothing at all when the Dorians and the the the, the, the Ivans and so on are coming around. They they they, they you know they they don't discriminate. So the house as an element is a complete structure. Right? It's a complete system. So what we're looking at is to ensure that all elements of that structure are constructed as designed in the best manner possible. So it means our joints, our you know, wall plate, our connection of our rafters to the wall plate, and all these systems need to work together. Right? I remember in Gilbert walking down the road, and luckily where I lived, the, house stayed, the roof stayed on. But, you know, although you're not supposed to walk out through the eye of the storm, being the age that I was, you know, I'd walk down the road, and I noticed that there was at least one house when the entire roof, now I don't mean ripped apart in elements, I mean the entire roof. If I was strong and powerful enough, I could have taken up the roof, flipped it over, and put it back on the structure. All right? So what that suggests to me that there are elements of that roof that were well constructed. Right, Mr. Sinclair? Some elements that were well constructed, but then, of course, there are others that definitely was not. Right? And so, hence, the person would have lost their roof. Right? So, we expect that the standards, the codes, the practices would guide us in the construction of various elements of, of the home and that the systems would be designed and put together to ensure that the structure as a whole continues to work together to protect you during these, 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 these events. So we have the high winds, and what it creates on your roof is um, basically suction on one side and, and uplift on, uh, on the next. It, the, 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 the hurricane is a dynamic event. It produces it, changing forces on your structure in all manner. So Gilbert, that passed directly over the island, by the time the eye passed, it means that the wind was affecting the roof in another direction. Right? So it, 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 consider that you're in a boxing match and, and your opponent is pummeling you on the right side. With, with, with the face and he, some, you know, at some point him kind of get a little tired and say, you know what, it's time for the left, all right? So you, 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 you figure that this is what your structure is going through. It is literally going through a fight with the elements and that slowly weakens the joints, it slowly weakens all the structural elements and so your puzzle now becomes starting to unravel, all right? So it is important that these elements are constructed as the engineer designs them to be. 
right? One of the problems that we have in the whole process is that even though we review the designs at the end of the day, we do have an inspection to ensure that these designs are, 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 are built as required, all right? Um, so you, you see there in the other slide that basically the wind is literally trying to you know, turn over this house. It's, it's trying to tear it apart. And so construction of those elements are, are vitally important. Right? Now, in the design of these structures, what happens? The engineer looks on the various elements. He looks on the, 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 the type of the wind speeds that your structure would be exposed to. The wind gusts, when, when we speak of the gusts, what we're talking about is you have sustained winds. And at some point, the wind is going to decide that, you know, I'm a little dynamic. I'm going to, 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 to change my, my frequency. I'm going to change my energy and so on, right? Um, so when they speak of the wind speeds in hurricane, they're talking about those average wind speeds, but they are moving up and you know plus or minus that that, and you have those little elements, those little eddies within the the, the hurricane itself that pro providing and producing other elements um, and uh, of 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 wind forces. All right. Now, so the engineer would design basically based on that. And what they look on is, is in terms of the size of the elements, the design of the joints, and the pitch of the roof, if we're talking about um, a wood frame roof or a pitch frame, frame roof. And so they design against those elements. And as Mr. Lou spoke about earlier in that, putting that whole package together, what you don't want to do is to have joints that help to to, 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 to weaken other joints. So you have a structure that has an eave, and what you would do is to ensure that the way it's designed, that that element would be able to separate itself um, if, if, if so weakened. Because you already know that in that structure, in that um, link, there's a, a weak link. And what you want to do is that if it moves, then it doesn't take the rest of the roof with it. So there are various design considerations that goes into depending on what the, the, the type of structure that we're talking about. All right? We're talking about the, the, the roof joints, rafters to roof plates, um, rafters to eave plates, um, purling connections. Um, Mr. Lou spoke about earlier about nailing these, these, these elements. The standard and best practice suggests that what you're using is log bolts or bolts and nuts or combinations of fasteners to ensure that you, you have a joint that can stand up to those, those forces. All right? Now, we have buildings of all types. So we, we, we saw earlier where I showed a building that had um, hip roofs, which is, is, is considered to be the type of structure that is best withstands the, 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 those wind elements, of course, if designed, designed properly. Um, wind from whichever direction would be reduce based on the, the angle of the roof and the, 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 the construction of the roof. Gable end roofs, a um, little more exposure because of the, the, the type of construction. Because of the gable end having a vertical face and normally producing an eave where the wind can take advantage of, of the construction. Um, and, and, and so on. You have flat, flat roofs. Now, if you remember in the slide earlier, we spoke about the suction, the uplift on structures. If we're talking about this, then you know, that type of roof would uh, not necessarily withstand those elements as well. All right? So this is timber frame. So one would say, then why not construct my house with a slab roof, right? And maybe we wouldn't have a, a, a problem when it comes to those wind elements. But then, what happens? Then you have a flood or you lose your foundation or you, you have a landslide and that house goes. So the bottom line is that, and what I'm trying to suggest to you is that where the construction of the home or improvement of the home as it relates to higher category winds, we're talking about proper construction methods, designed buildings designed by, by, by the, the, so those so trained to do, and the inspection of these elements to ensure that they are designed in accordance with the codes, the standards, and best practices. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're taking good notes. No? Well, I am. So, <laughs> Mr. Kelly, can I ask you to come? Yes. Good evening again, everyone. Good evening again. Um, the... I think um, both, both of the crises have, have um, pretty much presented 90% of um, 
what I would have tried to communicate to you. However, I'll, I'll do my best to see if I can, um, on the, 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 the construction perspective, um, to see if I can bring you um, some information. Now, now, natural disasters largely affect the most vulnerable, um, those who barely earn enough to feed their families, those who really trying to make their stomachs resilient and who cannot afford what is required to build resilient enough structures to withstand even the weakest of the hurricanes we are now seeing, uh, which we seem to be experiencing more frequently. Um, I want to just point out that we, we, we're facing two types of disasters. There, there are the natural disasters, and there are those wrought upon us because of our practices. And those, a lot of times, exacerbate the effects of the natural disasters. So it is something um, I think the policymakers and the regulators um, are to take a look at. There are some, some practices that we have. Um, don't want to go sideways, but you can't be building in a riverbed. And then when a tropical storm comes, you say you are the victim of a disaster. Come on. We can't, we can't continue like this. There are some responsibility we're going to have to take on ourselves. It is still the reverse bed. Now, let us I'll just look at a few things. And it's just some of the terminology. And this is for those who just are just talking to the regular householders, not technical. Now, whenever a system is coming here about tropical depression and tropical cyclone, tropical storm, and all of these things, essentially the, 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 the depression is formed when there's a low pressure um, area accompanied by some, maybe some rains and so on. And it kind of goes in a circle. That's as simple as I can put it. I'm trying to keep the language very simple. Now, the, 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 the depression essentially has winds which are pretty much below 39 miles per hour. Um, it upgrades to a tropical storm. However, when the, it becomes a little more organized, it starts, you know, spin more like a circle. You can say yes. And that's when most people, particularly on social media, start paying attention to it. Um, and when the, the, the maximum, um, what you call sustained wind gusts, are now ranging between 39 miles per hour and about 73 miles per hour. Now, your hurricane is also a tropical cyclone, just like a tropical storm. The hurricane just have higher wind speeds. That, that is really what it is. It's not, it's not no rocket science. It just, the winds go faster. And because they don't find any new names, they give the hurricanes all the categories. If they had other names, then category one would name something else, category two would name something else. So for now, we work with the hurricane, and it sounds ominous enough. Um, and, and these, as Chris explained, and Ms. Hamilton explained earlier, um, span a range of speeds up to about 153 or so miles per hour. Now, hurricanes that get to like a category three or higher are considered major hurricanes because of their potential for significant loss of life and damage. But there is a question this thought because we have had tropical storms that have dealt us some severe blows. Them don't name hurricane yet. And then we just try and have a look at why the category doesn't tell the whole picture. So you, 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 the classifications really provide some indication of the potential damage and flooding our hurricane will cause when it hits land. Because if it's out of sea and not, not affect nobody, everybody, all right, maybe two fishermen, and you're, most people not concerned. Now, because the categories are based strictly on wind speeds, and specifically sustained wind speeds over like probably about a one minute period, it 
does not account for intensity of rainfall, amount of rain, it does not account for storm surges or the size of the storm. So when you hear CAD5, some persons might experience a CAD5 and they come out maybe smelling a little less than roses and some people experience another CAD5 and it totally destroys them. You get the idea? So it's not just about wind, right? The, wind, the rain that comes with it, the height of the storm surges that come with it, all those things play a part. The speed at which the storm is moving, I think it was tropical storm, Nicole was a tricky one. Nicole formed like on the 28th of the month and disappeared on the 30th of the month and nearly drowned all away. I believe some areas had over 500 millimeters of rain. So we also want to be consider that the threat is not just when you hear category five. You can have significant effects even from a tropical storm. So I want you to just kind of keep that in the back of your head. The category, the, the higher the category is really just telling you there's going to be more wind and you're probably more likely to lose your roof if it's not a slab roof. So let us look at some examples from our, our recent, um, let us move down, our recent history. Um, 79, the June, it was June floods, wasn't any hurricane, just a tropical depression. No wind speed, very low wind, just rain. And, um, the, 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 the June floods came because there was a particular stretch of um, time that we were having rain on and off. So the ground was saturated. Now, for the, the layman, ground saturated means the ground full of water. So anything fall. If your dog pee pee, you get a flood because no more water can go down in the ground. That's simply what it means. You're going to get a flood. So you have a, a period of Heavy rain on top of the ground is already soaked, so all of that water is going to run to the sea. Um, my, my good friend and engineer calls it surface runoff. All right? Now, just in that, you had 42 deaths and almost 40,000 persons left homeless. It's not as the term call it a storm, it's a tropical depression that caused the rain. So we need to be mindful that huge disasters are there. Obviously, a lot of it too would be by our human practices. Now, I believe, and Dr. Kabi can correct me, I believe it was this is what caused the government to look at setting up a disaster. Um, response entity out of which um, ultimately came OdPem. I think it wasn't OdPem in the beginning. So um, so we got to this one which most of us know. If you know Loving Dear, you might, you might have reminded you. Wild Gilbert. No, yes man, you remember that. <laughs> now, this, one, this is from Beverly Hills and um, I was at St. Augustine at the time. And one of the things, one of the things that was pointed out to us, because people just lost wall roofs. The wall roof just come off. Um, structures are mainly left intact, but the people lost their roofs. Now, what used to happen back then is that, and I'll explain a little later, to hold the wall plate down, they used to just use the half inch steel that come up in the wall and just bend it over the board. And the man said, no boss, that even God can't move that. Gilbert straightened them out, it just lift up the roof, and when you went and looked, all the steel them straightened up back. Yes. So God did move it. Now, in terms of Gilbert, now note Gilbert is a category three, as I was pointed out earlier, as a direct hit. Um, and we get, we're getting these winds for like 10 to 12 hours. Um, hundreds were left ho homeless and Thousands had to go to like emergency shelters. Um, the number of deaths, however, was, was relatively low considering the intensity of the hurricane. Um, 
the, the, the relatively low, it's, it's 45 dead. It's still deaths, but given um, what we have seen in other areas, it could have easily run into the thousands. The next one we have a look at is Ivan. Um, CAD 5, when it made, um, when it came to us, now, of Ivan, we actually had 18,000 persons being left homeless. And um, I think the records were about 17 or so killed. Now, this is a picture from Caribbean Terrace. Now, one of the things with Ivan was it dumped a lot of rain, and the storm surges were, were just terrible. Now, these are concrete structures. So don't believe that because you build a concrete structure, it can't be destroyed. Nature put paid to that. And if you're actually, if you're actually gone there at the time and look at the structures, the slabs were like somebody use a, like a, a huge hammer and, and, and lick it, break them up into pieces. I mean, it was just, it was just unbelievable. Um, 2007, um, we had Hurricane Dean. Um, the, relatively speaking, it was a um, few lives lost, four and 500 injured, but the, there was a, a significant damage to the housing sector because Dean carried a lot of wind, not much rain. And there was um, something I recall seeing. And for homeowners, you can't waterproof your house under every situation. You just can't. We were working on the north coast at the time and standing at a hotel, um, the glass door, and we saw water dripping inside. The beach was probably about 100 feet off. And the, the wind, actually when we stepped back from the glass, the wind the, was, was, was driving the rain, so the rain was almost going horizontally. When it hit the glass, the wind was such that the water couldn't fall. The wind pushed the water up the glass. And we were looking at this thing in bewilderment. Up the glass, up the glass, over the top, and it dripped inside. So everybody who calls, boy, me was a leak, me was a leak. Just map it up and move on because you can't do anything about that. And if you didn't see that with your two eyes and somebody told me, I, would, I wouldn't want to believe it. So such is the nature of um, our storms. Now, this picture is of um, Portmore Back Road, um, 2010 September, tropical storm, Nicole. I believe Nicole was the one, right, that we said just farm two, three days, flood out, and just disappeared. It just was no more. It was, it was just amazing, and what it did, it just sat there and just dumped water, dumped water, dumped water on us. And so, um, for Nicole, I think Westmoreland got well over um, half a meter of rain in a period. Um, we had not a lot of homes being damaged, but uh, many communities um, basically surrounded by water. And uh, I think in the Chigwell area, anybody here from Hanover, Chigwell, um, areas in Monique where you have like this impermeable layer with nowhere for the water to go, so it's just an immediate pond. So you had houses that you couldn't see. You know, houses were there, but you couldn't see them because uh, there's so much water dumped and it took so long to gradually percolate. Um, those houses stayed underwater for a long time. Um, I think the, which one do we have? We have Tropical Storm Sandy, that is a storm surge against a coastal dwelling. If you look, you can see failure along the, that line along the top of the windows. You can see like it breaking away. That is what the wave action will do. It's a storm surge. So when you want that nice little beach house, that kind of thing, just, just bear in mind that these things will. So the, the category five experience, um, it is that, Catastrophic damage is expended, just based on the, 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 the nature of the, the, the wind speeds. Um, we're going to see complete roof failures on many, many residences. We're going to see um, irreparable damage to many wood frame structures. I know we have a lot of that, as we spoke about 
um, those persons who can't afford to build the block on steel, those, those persons are going to be um, seriously at, at risk. And, um, and not many structures can survive a Cat 5 um, intact. It's going to lose some, some, some part of it will go. It's going to get some farmer damage. Um, and, and this also causes um, to the, the lower floors. If you look at Dorian, you'll find that even when you have multi-story buildings, the lowest floors were basically <laughs> wiped out. All the windows, doors, everything, the surges just ran through there. It was almost like the buildings were in the middle of the sea when you look at the, the surges coming in. The, the, we had a look at um, storms that made landfall at Category 5 that hit land. If it, as I say, if it's out of sea, then don't bother anybody. So then don't consider it have any consequence. They don't do any damage, really. Um, and so we're talking about going back, Dorian, Michael, Maria, Irma, Felix, Dean, Katrina, Andrew, Gilbert, David. Now, of the 35 hurricanes that had attained Category 5, in the Atlantic, we're not, we're not, we're not, we don't consider the Pacific, just what affects us. What we found is that half of those hurricanes had wind speeds of 175 miles per hour. Now the CAD 5 is 153 miles per hour. Half of those hurricanes that are designated, categorized as CAD 5, half of them have uh, wind speeds of 20 miles per hour greater. You understand? Because you see, you, you have to stop. Category 5 of a bandwidth stop. So usually, those that go beyond Category 5, nobody really, we don't give a lot of attention to what kind of power these hurricanes are packing, but they are still called Category 5 because you're limited to around 153. Yeah, where, where it starts. It can go higher, but from it hit 153, so this band, if it can go higher, then that band, that Cat 5 band is very wide. So you can have some serious wind speeds coming out. What we also found is that about a quarter of them, of these Cat 5 hurricanes, had wind speeds of over 180 miles per hour. Um, and the, we, the, the code developers, the code reviewers, um, we're going to need to start taking a look at um, the CAT5 um, to perhaps break it down or give it some new name or something. But I think it is something that we need to look at. So things to consider. Um, Chris spoke to about, um, Chris Lou spoke about making your current house resilient. And Mr. Hamilton spoke about somewhat building resilient. So I just want to touch on a few quick things. Number one, the expertise. If you decide to build, get professional advice. Get the professionals to do it. There is not a simple thing. Now, as you're seeing here, it's, it's not a simple thing that you go out and buy that man down the road did build Mass Charlie house, so he's going to build your house for you. No, it, it doesn't quite work that. You just go get, that man can draw a plan, so he just draw a plan for you. No, get professional advice. We have engineers, we have architects, we have registered contractors. Get the right people for the job. Better you negotiate with them, but remember, your house is the single biggest investment most of us will make. The single biggest investment you'll make. And remember, that is where you plan to keep your, you and your family safe. Do it properly. Um, many, many, many bark at the idea of going that way, but remember, the risk is with you. Right? Um, site selection is critical. Even oh, if you have a big lot, even oh, your position the house and the land is, is, is important. Um, 
you have a acre land part of a gully, don't put it down in the gully. Um, talk to the experts, they'll tell you the best place to position it. Um, avoid avoid low-lying and coastal unless you are padded enough to replace the house after the CAD 5. Other than that, if you know your one house this, avoid low-lying and coastal. Avoid flood plains, avoid river banks, certainly avoid river beds. Slopes with unstable soil, um, and there are some rock types, some soil types that we, 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 we try to avoid also. Um, clear and those what we call low-bearing low soils. Those will bring, you, bring, bring drama up on you anytime you have a natural disaster. We look at the construction methods, and Doc is telling me to wrap up, so I'm going to don't know. Um, we typically look at a few things. Um, you have the shiplap wood frame structure. Uh, we use clinker board on the side. Anybody from Westmoreland and them place that you'd see those like a nice quaint board houses. Um, so you have those types. You have you have your block and steel, and now a lot you have um, the poured wall, cast in place, concrete walls, and it can either be slab roof or your wood frame roof with whatever you want to put on it, shingles, zinc, whatever you want to put on it. The last thing we're looking at is the elements. Your foundation types, your professional will help you with that. Your wall types, we spoke to that already. Your roof, um, your, your reinforced concrete slab gives you the best resistance. It, it going hot by AC. It gives you the best resistance, but not necessarily the best aesthetic. And I see the, the architects looking me, steering me down. <laughs> yes. They have earthquake considerations. Um, the, the, the slope of your roof is important. Um, for us, the, the hip roof is better than the, the, that's a gable, that's a hip. This is the preferred type. Um, no, for your, for your walls, and are this, are, are closing off now. You see that J-looking thing? That's called a J-bolt. If after the, your beam cast, and you don't see a piece of metal bolt sticking up out of it? With treading on the end, as Doc said. You need to talk to the contractor there. <laughs> you understand? Matter of fact, before him say I'm going to cast the bell beam, that is if you're putting on a timber roof, nice, pretty roof, um, you want to get somebody go up there and make sure that these bolts are in there at most 30 um, inches apart, right? Now, these are what hold on. This thing here is called a wall plate. And this is what your roof, your rafters sit on. Hold the roof down. Now, when you put the rafters on it, like this, you see the rafters here now. This is the plate. These here are the top of the j board. So they tread in and you would put the nut and the washer on it. It's, 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 it's pointless. It's pointless. If the j bolt is in there, and the man don't put any nut or wash on it, then your roof gone anyway because there's nothing hole in the plate down. You get in the idea? So this is the plate, and then the rafters sit on the plate. And you screw the rafters to the plate, but you also use what you call hurricane straps, these things here. Right? Um, I think I probably have it right. This is the one we most commonly use. And all the holes are to be used. Some of them come with 10 holes, and the carpenter put one screw at the top and one screw at the bottom and leave the other eight holes. That's not supposed to happen. You know, that is why we have to supervise. We have to watch every single thing. So this is the rafter, and this would be the plate, so it holds the rafter to the place. It's called a hurricane strap for the reason that when the hurricane comes, the roof sits. Right? So thank you. Um, I just want to have a parting shot. A parting shot is that um, government, when, it, when, when we're having a, a hurricane coming, we usually, they usually tell you to go to the, um, the shelter. However, I think the shelters need to be continuously assessed to ensure that they can withstand Category 5. Thank you. So we are, we are progressing nicely. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Martin now to come. Um, of course, financing is an, is an important part of home ownership. So Mr. Martin will 
tell us whether or not we, there is a role for the financing institutions in disaster risk reduction? Okay, thank you. Um, now, I haven't heard from the architect, the um, engineer, and the builder. <laughs> uh, the question, uh, how can a financial institution assist you in building that dream, dream home uh, to withstand a Category 5 uh, hurricane? And also, what um, assistance can a financial institution offer to mitigate against the adverse impact? And also, how can we contribute to a reduction in global warming? Because um, many of the issues that we face right now comes from what the scientists call global warming that results in the sea being very, I mean, being, having an elevated temperature and lead, leading to more powerful storm. Now, um, I was given um, a six-page speech, but given the time that Mr. <laughs> what, what's the name again? Mr. <laughs> Kelly spent. I've just decided to pick out some salient points from my presentation, so I won't read the six-page speech. Um, about two years ago, uh, Jane Bank become the, became the vehicle for the Inter-American Development Bank, first and only project to provide loan funding to developers to establish water-efficient dwellings. Um, I know that's important given the, I mean, the, the, the drought conditions that we are seeing right now. Um, you know, so we play a critical role in terms of um, providing financing for the technology to drive water harvesting and green water cycling, recycling. Uh, so, you know, if there are any developers in the house, I mean, that is, J that is something that JN provides. And also for, you know, for other homeowners, we can actually assist you uh, with respect to preserving water, you know, uh, catching water during the rainy season to ensure that when we have these um, droughts, uh, you don't have a problem uh, with respect to getting water. Uh, we are also a major financer for, for developments uh, throughout Jamaica. Uh, we finance quite a number of projects. Uh, I think outside of the NHD, we are, we are the largest uh, provider of financing uh, to developers. And um, I, I guess we play a critical role with respect to the standards because um, a precondition for approval is that uh, th these projects must, must have the professionals, as I spoke about earlier, uh, architects, engineers, uh, must have uh, town and planning approval, absolutely critical to ensure that you know, there's, there's complete adherence to the building standard. And also during construction, we have our professionals that go on site to ensure that the buildings are being constructed um, with respect to the, the specification. Also, with respect to mortgages, I mean, a critical uh, role that we play is that before we give mortgages, especially for construction, we actually have engineers that go to, I mean, to, to, to the site to ensure um, that the way the, I mean, where the mortgages is building, uh, it, it is suitable. I know in the past there have been examples where people build in sinkholes. Uh, many, many years ago, I mean, we, we no longer made that mistake, you know. So, you know, so, I mean, so, so that is critical and ensure that people don't build on riverbed, uh, ensure that they get the appropriate tone and planning uh, approval. So it's absolutely critical. But um, looking specifically at financing, um, we offer what is known as uh, equity loan. So having, get, having gotten a mortgage, what you find is that maybe as time uh, goes by, the value of a house increases in value, and the value of the, of the loan, I mean, decreases. So you, you, you have what is known as equity. And we actually encourage our members to actually utilize that benefit uh, to borrow, and use the proceeds to enhance their homes, I mean, you know, to put in shutters uh, and other, you know, factors that, are, that are actually enhance the value of their home and make those homes more resilient to hurricanes. So that is something you can get a from a financial institution. And don't wait until the hurricane is coming. Assess your home and, and see where, you know, you can actually strengthen your home in terms of shutters, uh, having stronger doors, I mean, improving your drains. I mean, these are the financing that JM Bank can provide. And of course, we have a, uh, we have a insurance company, JNGI. Uh, we provide peril insurance for all mortgages that we do. But what I find amazing is the low level of insurance that is done by, uh, by, 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 the, by, uh, by Jamaicans. And recently, we saw where uh, insurance rates fell to historically low levels. And we were surprised that uh, Jamaicans did not take advantage you know, of that opportunity to actually, in, actually to insure their home. 
you know, so it's, you know, so it's absolutely critical, you know, that that um, you know, that we actually avail ourselves of insurance. And in the past, what we have done is that when you know, when we have had these disasters, we usually offer moratorium to to our members, you know, up to six months. I mean, to allow them to um, to get on their feet. So while we are not directly involved in construction, I think we play a critical role in terms of ensuring that uh, the appropriate standards are adhered to. And we also provide financing you know, to our members to ensure that they, you know, that, that they construct a house that can actually withstand the elements. So you know, I guess having heard the presentations from the gent gentlemen, if you have any concerns about your housing conditions, I think JN, Bank and JN, GI, the, the insurance company, I, th I think we are the entities that you should, you should look to to ensure uh, you know, that your home can withstand any adverse weather condition. So thank you. I think I've, I've, I've actually got brought by the time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Martin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at the Department of Civil Engineering, this is at the St. Augustine campus, we have been trying to determine if we can come up with a form of housing construction that is best suited to Caribbean conditions. We all know about how we have been building for the last donkey years. Can we do better? And can we do it more cost effectively? So what we've come up with is a new material. It's not quite new. We give it a new name. Uh, we've done some innovation to it and we think that gave us a right to call it something new we call it high energy composite and what it really is is a form of reinforced concrete but it's really thin we talk about half things but we can bend it into different shapes by bending it into the different shapes we are able to come up with different kinds of elements so we have come up with a new kind of roofing and a new kind of wall system, and they could be used independently. Meaning you can take this new roof system that we call ribbon design and put it on top of what we are accustomed doing for the walls, be it um, masonry walls, timber walls, you can have the two separate. Likewise, you can have your a wall, we bend it into a C shape and we'll see in a little while. We put it on the corners and that will give you your strength. You can then fill the space with the materials you're accustomed to. Where a lot of the promise savings from is this material is so easy to work with, you can provide your own labor and do house construction as a do-it-yourself project or as a community project. This is where most of the promise is. One of the other issues that we looked at is, if you look at how we build now, there are so many things that go into a roof. You start at the top, and let's say you go in with your normal zinc roof in. Then you have to tie that to your, to your lat or your rafter below. Then you have to tie that to your, um, your rafter. Each of these have to have, to have hurricane shafts. Then the rafter has to be properly tied to the uh, wall plate, then the wall plate, and you keep on going like that. It's too many things, and we don't really have that much qualified uh, supervision during construction. So that causes a lot of problems. A lot of the time, we know what to do is get it done right. So in looking at this new design, one of the things we try to look at is reducing all those million and one components that you have and keeping it simple. So let's continue. Uh, so what we're looking at, Caribbean housing requirements. We must also mention that when we have to consider housing in the Caribbean, it's not just about hurricanes. It's also about earthquakes. So however we build, it must be able to take both the hurricane and the earthquake. So Caribbean housing requirements, no more earthquake or hurricane problems and at affordable prices. What we are investigating, we believe, is earthquake resistant, hurricane resistant, 
sustainable in, in the sense that it uses less carbon for manufacture. Affordable, meaning that it should be less expensive than conventional construction, especially if labor is community-based. Low maintenance, meaning the corrosion is going to be very minimal over time. And because you can make this thing like you could make Crick's Biscuit uh, on a semi-industrial basis in a backyard industry thing or community industry, you can assemble it pretty quickly and therefore the construction time would be much faster. So without getting into too much of the technical characteristics, uh, it's called a laminitimentitious composite advanced material that is strong, durable, attractive, fast, and easy to fabricate, complies with design standards and code requirements, precast section, or you can build it on site. The form like so you can have linear sections or you can have curved sections. It is naturally earthquake, hurricane, and impact resistant. It is naturally waterproof, and it can be designed for thermal control by putting styrotex, let us say, in the body of the material. Potentially, now this would vary from Caribbean territory to territory, it can yield savings of up to 40% on the roofing and 35% for single-story housing. This has, is as regards the structure. That does not include the electrical and plumbing. And 25% for two-story. And we're talking true lifetime service because, as I mentioned before, the maintenance cost is minimal. But when it comes to innovations, these are some of the technical innovations. Uh, because we are making up the roof by basically assembling strips of precast elements that are like half inch thick, we call it the ribbon design. Now, to get the, the ribbon to hold on to the lat or after below, we have to use special little connections. And you'll see in a while where we have done some testing on those so we know what, how much pulling out force each connection takes. So if we want to resist a Cat 5 hurricane, it's simply a matter of determining how many of those connections you need to install on your roof. So let's take a look at what we're talking about. The most basic element looks like this. So we have the ribbon element. We could also call it a shingle element. So you're seeing the red um, longitudinal elements. They're overlapping each other. Well, where it overlaps, you have the connection below. And this connection is to either your timber lat or your Z pulling or your steel section, depending on which territory you are building your roof in. In this case here, we are showing that we could even use the material to make purlins. We can also use the material to make the ring beam in the form of permanent formwork. So you have this thing in such a way that it's shaped like a U. So you have the space in the middle to put your, your cage of, of reinforcement. And then you put your, your concrete inside of that. So the composite, the, what that we are calling the HEC, remains in place like a formal. So that, in, in that way, you can get your ring beam. Now, remember, we said that these are really two systems, a roof system and a wall system, and they can act independently. If they are acting together, as is shown in the, in the little picture here, we would have wall elements made up of these corner and middle pieces that really look like if you take a cardboard box and you stretch it out. So if you cut across it, you're getting like a C-shape. Now, of course, this is the, what the skeleton would look like. You could always fill this up with anything and get it to look like conventional material. You could fill it up with uh, pieces of block and then mortar up the whole thing. It would look solid, but it's really, the skeleton of it is really these elements. So we've been working on how um, to get these elements to perform adequately, and you only really need them on the corners. If you have a longer span, then you can put one in the mid span on each side as well. As is shown in the diagram here, they themselves sit inside of precast foundations. We call them pocket bases. So just like we have for the ring beam, they are U-shaped elements. So your vertical HEC elements fits in that. You pour concrete over and there it is, you have your foundation. Because we are making this up in little shapes like Lego, 
we can build any complex shape by the sum of these little shapes. Now the next slide is showing some of the experimental work we've been doing at UE to make sure that the equations and so that we are using to calculate the stresses are actually making good predictions with testing in the lab. So if you look at the upper left, you see single, you see how thin it is? What we are testing there, if you look closely below, you see a light blue um, element. That is really a steel rafter. And we have our connection attached to that. So this test is about testing how much force is required to separate the new roofing element from the rafter below. So we've done tests like that for both steel rafters and timber rafters. So we know how many rafters we would need to resist a cat five or whatever. But we weren't only focusing on housing structures. So some of these pictures here show more industrial applications. So the one on the upper right is showing more of a long span sort of an arrangement that you might have for a factory shell. So you're seeing the haunches at the ends. The bottom left is showing, you notice that the element is a bit thicker in this case, in order to offset heating costs, we have put styrotex in the middle. So that's why it's a little bigger. And the span is sufficiently long to simulate industrial roofing. The codes and the approval agencies that are enforcing the codes would require us to provide calculations that show the stresses for this new material. So the bottom right is showing some of the stress contours as colors that we have um, gone through the calculations and prepared reports and so, so that approval agencies can have the information they need to approve this new material. The next slide is showing our test element for a wall system. Remember we said it's really just this C-shaped section. It's a C if you cut it across horizontally, right? And you are building up your walls as it's shown on the diagram on the right by just assembling these C's on the corners and one on each side of your long span. One or two, depending on, on your conditions. So you have the testing that we've done. We've done We've been doing this for over the last 20 years, a bit by bit collecting the information. When you consider, I think one of the previous speakers highlighted that it is the single most important investment you will make. It is where your spouse and your children will be sleeping. You don't want to be cutting corners on your stress calculations and so on. So bit by bit, we've been doing testing, repeating testing. So the diagram on the left is showing a test element. We also involve our students in their training for research into these projects. And the one on the right is showing the kind of stresses that we would be involved in the wall element if you have an earthquake. So having accumulated sufficient data in the lab, what's the next step? The next step is to build an actual prototype house in the field. We would like to, for instance, God forbid that we have the hurricanes that we're going to have them. If we could put a prototype house in the path of one of these things and really see what it would do. Then it would be like the final bit of information we would need to give confidence to end users and stakeholders that this research product developed in the Caribbean for the Caribbean is actually workable. We will also need, of course, some field testing. We can always do additional analysis and, and testing to refine the model. Ultimately, we would like to partner with regional governments, organizations, and businesses in order to carry this product from a research and development concept to something that could really significantly act uh, as regards disaster risk reduction. So with that, I thank you and come to the end of this presentation. All right, uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have listened to a lot. There's much to think about. I am sure that you have many questions that you'd like to ask our panelists. We did have some resource persons in the audience. I think we've lost some of them. But I see my, my former colleague, Norman Harris, is here. Norman was at Mines and Geology Division for many years. A wealth of experience in geotechnical engineering. Um, there was also somebody else from Mines and Geology. I don't know if they're still here. 
They could advise on issues related to slope stability and so on. How many persons knew that there was a hillside construction policy for Jamaica? A few, a few persons did. Um, let, me, let me just say, and I'm not advertising, but the, the technical agencies of government are very important for getting information. They do a lot of work, and there's a lot of data and a lot of information which you can get from them, which is applicable to building resilience. So take advantage of them. Mines and Geology, Water Resources Authority, um, SRC, and so on. Take advantage of them and inform yourselves before you embark on your building or your retrofitting project. All right, so are there any questions for our panelists? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Question. I think you, I think you mentioned yes. equity. Yes. One of the one of the the things we are hoping um, we can take advantage of is going back to the old style way of doing housing construction. The community gets together. Another by providing the labor. If you do that, the cost of the elements, the cost of the cost construction drops dramatically. Now, this has a sort of a same industrial feel to it because remember, these are precarious elements, so we're talking about molds. So, what we envisage is um, supporting entities, be it government or private organizations, providing the molds, and the community is given the, the knowledge how to build the elements. One of the um, characteristics of the element, formerly called ferrous cement, really good final end product performance with very little skin. So with the, these most and simple hoisting equipment, you can have cottage industries. The price would be drastically reduced. That's the cost of the enforcement, which is basically chicken wire. Sorry, do you remember from the 1970s, there was a Cuban system in Jamaica that was never, no units were really built with the Sandino system, where it was the, the post and panel system. <coughs> there was a, a king of, one of the plants was in West Milan, in Landilo, in West Milan, in Jamaica, but it never really got off the ground. In that system, the panels were what you call of a size that two men or women could lift them. A same sweat equity situation, but your, your panels are bigger. In this case, remember, the elements are really, really thin. So yeah, we think that uh, people could lift it, but you can also have these simple hoisting block and tackle arrangements to put the, the elements into place. At the end of the day, this thing is like a half an inch thick. We just bend it into different shapes. What about topography limitations? The flat side, basically. If you have a sloping side, is no different than, than you would construct now. You would adjust your foundation to suit. But whatever is receiving the panel will be on a level. So it shouldn't be a, an issue whether you have a sloping side or, or a flat side. A flat side. Uh, yes. A uh, question for Dr. Clark. I didn't hear how the panels would be connected, especially like the roof to the wall. I, I didn't hear that part. So can you please repeat? It's connected at the base through what we would call a pocket-based foundation. In other words, you immerse the element into solid concrete. Of course, you have your, your concrete form. You place the element into the form, and you cast the concrete around it. So that is at the base. At the top, remember we, we showed in, the, in the, uh, the slide that you have a permanent form work. So you have this element that is shaped like a, like a um, U, but it's like more like a W, that sits on top of the wall and it forms a ring beam. So you have simple connectors, a simple connector from the top of the wall element going into 
that precast formal, and then you pour your you put your cage and you pour your concrete. So you get a positive connection between the panel element and the ring. Uh, my question is to the engineer, the um, gentleman from the GIE. Uh, in terms of the yeah, in terms of the code, the the building code, the new building code, um, is there a design a, de a design for the wind loads and what is it currently? The consideration really is is really what 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 wind loads you are designing for, right? Um, I work with the government, so for example, for buildings that we 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 have designed we have indicated a particular wind load because we consider that those buildings are exposed to extreme risk based on their locations and so on. All right. Um, if I remember correctly, the wind loads there would have been somewhere in the region of 120 miles per hour. And I figure that is why you're asking, <laughs> considering <laughs> that, 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 that we're talking about storms beyond the Category 3. But one thing to remember, though, is that the new building code, the new national building code, is pegged to the, the IBC that gets reviewed every three years. So the expectation is that if there are special considerations relating to these um, you know, higher class elements, that these things would get upgraded as the codes are upgraded. Um, okay, so uh, Richard, we'll, we'll, we'll speak to that as well. Hold on for me. Uh, good evening, everyone. Richard Lawrence from the Bureau of Standards, Jamaica. Um, in terms of the, the building code, it's interesting that you asked that question. I was talking to Al Adams a few hours ago. He is on his way to the Eastern Caribbean where they're having discussion um, on matters pertaining to resilience. We are currently looking to update the building code to the 2018 version, as Chris said, of the IBC. <clears throat> I'll had a, a concern with climate change and with the category five hurricanes being more frequent than before, if we should consider upgrading the values. What we're going to do is, the consultants are now upgrading the code based on a MOU we have with the International Code Council in the, in the US. We're going to bring that draft for public comments. It includes members of GIA, GIE, um, Master Builders Association, <coughs> and that consideration will be put on the table. So if it is that we as a country, because the code is based on consensus, as a country we believe that the, the maximum value needs to be increased from where it's at, mm. that will be a part of the consultant. Consultations. Um, good night. I'd just like to ask a quick question. Um, the question is housing for who? If it's agreed that already without hurricanes or earthquakes, this housing situation for a vast group of persons in Jamaica is probably at risk, what feasibly can be done to change that situation? Because it's, it sounds very nice. It's similarly, you hear a lot of drive right now about breast cancer, but nobody talks about the truth, about the link between breast cancer and lung cancer. You know, it's just dressed up with some pink ribbons, but it's not, we're not dealing with the reality, because if you are in difficulty with a house, the mortgage companies are going to bang on your door. They want their money. I don't know about moratoriums. It doesn't exist. You write to every single agency in this country and say, we are suffering from global warming. We see water coming up through the floors. We see the walls cracking in Greater Portmore. There has been absolutely no response. So I want to find out, have there been any studies? And all the, the panelists can say to me, if, they, if there have been studies of the people on the ground who are building their shacks and so on. Have there been a study that shows which ones have been resistant to hurricanes and earthquakes so that the rest of the poorer persons in Jamaica could follow those models? 
because some of these models, they're so nice, but they're not affordable. Mm. I, 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 do not th I do not know if my question is hinging on um, what has been asked. But again, I, I know this is a public forum, and a lot of us who came probably, probably are struggling, even though we might be middle income, so many of us are upper income, struggling with mortgage. Um, recently, I, I got a rude awakening as to all the fees. I heard about the insurance, and the question is, can we afford? And I heard, apart from the housing insurance, you need a life insurance and the value of the house, and all these, all, all these fees. And when Dorian occurred and affected Bahamas, I, I um, thought about Jamaica, and I said, I wonder what would have happened if it was Jamaica. The, the reality is, majority of the persons would have suffered because of poverty. So when we say that, yes, we have the engineers and you have these persons, um, you know, and hire, hire these proper contractors and so on, the question is, who can afford the, the, um, the proper contractors? Um, even when we try to kind of get a good one, we have to think about who's going to steal some of the cement that was supposed to reinforce this. We can't, we cannot stand there and monitor. And even if we stand and monitor, we're like idiots because we do not know, you know, the, the know-hows. So it, 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 it seemed good to have the information, but then at the end of the day, I'm thinking about just the common man. Who can really afford? Is, is the government, does the government have something in place to say, well, if you go to the bank, just like how the rate for NHT has been dropped to 4% interest, you can get it to 2%. I know from NHE speaking with them recently, if you take a loan, you max out your 6.5 and you get your rest from the bank. And you know a lot of us buy an existing house and we want to look at the house and see if it's you know, in good condition. You can't get that um, renovation loan until 15 years. So if anything happens, you die in that house until 15 years. So there are certain a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> you're laughing, but there are a lot of things that come into play. And I, and, and I really want us to address the financing part. I know it's not just about Jane, but it's all about the engineers and the architects. Would you be willing to work with the government to come up with a rate that to say, well, you know, 2% interest or something for the, for the poorer class of people and even us who can't, who's struggling? Yeah, I'm the closest one to the mic, so they push me away. <laughs> um, no, but... but, but Remember also that that government has um, an engineering entity in the NWA. So um, it would obviously be a, a kind of what you call a social program, or really and truly, if you if you if you if you if you look at it in this way, if um, JN is going to give a loan to for you to purchase a house. JN should ensure that that asset matches what is being paid for. So JN should ensure that there is a structural inspections to determine the suitability of the house. Because not only will it be that, well, you might die in the house, um, strictly speaking, they're more concerned that they, they probably have a useless asset. So really, there are, there are, I think there are ways, there are creative ways to, to, to perhaps look at it. Um, um, they would, the, 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 the finance houses would, would charge you for it anyway. They're going to find somewhere to put it in there, even as an inspector. But at least you get the feeling like you're getting it for free. Um, but, but there are some ways that, 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 that it can be done. And I'll just put it out there that the IMAJ actually as a resource person that we employ that's in-house two days per week just for serving the public. So you can call incorporated master builders. Any question you have about construction, um, they'll come out and do also inspections and so on. So no, that's, there's no cost. The person is, the IMAJ pays the person a salary monthly, right? So the person is there, his name is Mr. Rogers. You can look up the number and call. He's there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Mr. Purvis Rogers. Thank you. Yeah, okay. um, uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. In terms of um, low-income housing, though, it seems to me 
that the research being carried out in St. Augustine is very important. If you can cut the cost of building a simple structure by 30 to 40 percent, it's going to bring it into the reach of a lot more people. So I think we, we have interest in trying to get a prototype of that construction system done so we can test it um, going forward because I think it has excellent implications for affordable housing for a large number of persons. Um, we have a question from Dr. Northover. Yeah. Yes, um, thank you for putting on this excellent forum. I'm really happy to be here and um, learning a lot about the processes of building re hurricane resistant homes. Um, the issue I wanted to throw out was in terms of the attempt to arrive at some sort of consistency when we're thinking about um, our resilience in, in meeting hurricane threats or other threats um, of that kind in, in, in small island states. And I think one of the challenges that we have here is not just looking at the construction industry, but looking at our land and our zoning policies because we're not consistent. And therefore we're building in areas that we shouldn't be building and we're, we're promoting new developments in areas that are already under threat. And in, in particular, if you think about Portmore, I mean, it's on the sea level. It has a number of challenges in terms of evacuation um, from, from storm surges, given the way in which the, 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 the highways are located and where the high low highways have been constructed um, in terms of their, their susceptibility to flooding. So, what are we doing when we're building mega constructions where large percentage of our populations are in these dwellings and are trying to arrive at security? But if we do have a sustained threat, like a, a Dorian that's, that stays over the land area for, for two days or however long it stays, we're in serious trouble because we shouldn't have been building in those areas, but we're still building in those areas and where even no matter how resistant the construction is, if, if the land on which you're building, you should not be there, the, the house doesn't matter. So unless there is an overlapping consistency between our land use and spatial zoning policy and our hurricane construction resistant homes, we will be, we will be in, a, in a quandary nonetheless. And this is a, the spatial dynamics of the housing problem is an urgent and fundamental concern because of the amount of people that it impacts. And I think we need to be thinking that the building codes which have just been promulgated, just 10 years old, all our housing stocks were built without sufficient standards in terms of their construction um, stability and strength. So we have a huge problem. So I think we need to be thinking long term in terms of our land use management and spatial zoning while we're also thinking about the construction of these houses. I just want to make one little, little point. The, one of the reasons I feel strongly about land use is because I'm interested in rural development. And we have a food security crisis on our hands. The global food systems are collapsing. Most of people don't realize that. But this, the, the species that we take for granted, bees, are near extinction. When the bees go, we don't have a, feed, a food system. We have, we have monocultural systems of production internationally, which are, under con, which are under fundamental stress. And everywhere you look, these systems are not going to be sustainable. What we're putting concrete on prime agricultural land, and we're saying that this is an adequate policy to deal with our housing needs. We are breaking the very rules that we have put down in terms of land use, and we're cutting off our neck. I don't know to spite what. Because we will have a food security crisis in the region, which imports up to 70% of its food, and we have a huge import bill. So unless we look at these things systematically and think long term in terms of our moving forward to have resilience, we are going to be in a catastrophic state. And these are not questions that 
I am making up. If you look at any international documentation from every organization, you'll see there is a global food crisis that is not being spoken about. And if we give up the land any further, we are going to be in the position where you have starving people in Jamaica. There's a multiplicity of very salient points you have made. I don't know if you're aware that in sectoral presentation, our Minister Vaz, who has portfolio responsibility, as you hear some snickering, for um, land and the environment, <laughs> made mention that the National Spatial Plan, remember I mentioned that briefly, because we were talking about, but you cannot speak about disaster resilience, homeowners retrofitting, homeowners considering building new and designing or getting designs done without looking at National Spatial Plan. And that is supposed to be complete by the end of this year. So I assume there'll be stakeholder meetings and I hope all of you will be there. Because what I understand based upon information coming out of a post cabinet press briefing some months ago from the then Minister of Information and Education, Senator, was that an English company called Acclimatize had been given the contract to do seven technical papers to inform the National Spatial Plan. So therefore, when that spatial plan draft is presented to the nation, meaning us, it behooves us to participate, download it from NEPA's website or wherever it is located, and actually read it. You raise many salient points. One of my concerns personally is that we used to have a building research institute. What Dr. Clark is doing, correct? At St. Augustine is what we used to do. At the former Ministry of Housing on Hagley Park Road, where you notice demolitions have occurred, and, 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 but they have not demolished. And my memory is fading as to what they were. There are two demonstration homes or units there. One of them has a barrel precast looking roof. And I think the blocks were made out of bauxite waste, mud. So th those are examples of the Building Research Institute of Jamaica at the time. We no longer have a Building Research Institute. When we speak about affordable housing or no income housing, when Dr. Clark speaks about sweat equity, that was an attempt which never occurred. Remember, going back in history and housing provision, we had sites and services. Did not continue. We have now in a situation where we have greenfield development occurring back to the spatial plan. What we have is a spatial plan that is catching up or, 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 or dealing with what is there already that was never planned. Going back in history, I believe it is 1970 odd, there was a national atlas. The UDC and the Rural Township Development Program had identified nodes of development where social infrastructure, health centers of various types were to be provided based upon the population growth pattern expected, Santa Cruz, whatever. What we have seen is organic growth, where sit towns like Santa Cruz have just grown, and there's been no planned infrastructure to provide for the needs of the people. We have development which is occurring ahead of infrastructure. So those are the issues, and you notice when I mention Greenfield, there are very few Brownfield, and Brownfield is not for Kingston. Brownfield sites exist in Spanish Town, Montego Bay. Remember, relocation 2000, we were supposed to move Mona Commons. We are here, Mona Commons is still there, and the population has changed or increased. There is a national housing policy draft. That seriously addresses many of the concerns. It is still a draft. When it goes to public presentation and debate or discussion, you need to be there because it speaks holistically about land tenure, mortgages, enabling Jamaicans to access financing, build our own land, informal settlements, upgrading settlements, all these things that we have attempted successfully and not so successfully for decades since independence. Remember, what that document speaks is a 15,000 unit shortfall per annum in housing solutions. We're not talking about house necessarily, but let me stop. No, no, no as I said, this is a broad, broad topic and housing is a critical part of Jamaica's social infrastructure. If you do not have a house, you cannot create a home, and we see the results of no homes.
or not enough homes where people, young people, children can develop in an environment that creates a stable society built upon discipline and commitment to nation building. So ladies and gentlemen, before we go to the next question, the question I would like to put to you is, how do we engage the authorities on these issues? Because we obviously, based on the reaction here, we, we recognize the truth of what is being said. But how are we going to engage the authorities? Because trust me, no change will come unless we bring it, right? No change will come un unless we cause it. We have to engage whether it is our councillors, our members of parliament, working through social media, engaging the young people. We're going to have to drive the change that is required. And I completely agree. We have several crises facing us. One of them is a food security crisis that we are simply ignoring. We're simply ignoring it. The other crisis we're going to have is a heat crisis when we continue to put up concrete and asphalt and remove trees, despite the fact that every year the average temperature is increasing. But all of these issues we need to bring to the fore ourselves, because we simply can't wait on the authorities to do it. It's not going to happen. Any, any more questions? No? Yeah. Well, I think we, 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 we would have to make our voices heard. The question is, how do we stop the authorities from doing what they really ought not to be doing? Or they should be doing what they're doing differently? So, I mean, I, I, I put the question out there for you. Yes. I just want to reinforce something. Uh, I agree with what you're saying, Dr. Northover, about the density because increasingly my concern is so the high rise buildings and the you know I live in Hope Pastures and we're seeing it transformed and what used to be a one family household on a third of an acre you know is now 40 apartments and I'm just thinking about not just the load-bearing capacity and whether or not the building can withstand the storms, but you know what happens when we do have a hurricane and when the infrastructure crumbles more because it's already starting to crumble, and we see the water crisis getting worse every year. And I don't know that these people are availing themselves of the loans that you've made available uh, for water harvesting, but I don't see any water harvesting facilities being built. And I'm thinking it can't be optional. It can't be something that is given, you know, um, as, a, as, a, as an option because they'll take it off the table to cut cost. There needs to be, you know, a, a requirement in order for you to get planning permission, you need to meet X, Y, and Z. And we're seeing a lot of the um, uh, standards that used to be um, uh, enforced, or at least they were on the table, like having play areas and green spaces. All of those things, by and large, have been compromised. And it, it, it can't be you know, something that we just overlook because the country needs uh, to develop and we need housing. What kind of housing, what type of quality of life do people live in these high-rise concrete boxes? You know, Bob Marley spoke about the concrete jungle many, many years ago. He didn't know about climate change, but he spoke about, you know, the, 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 the burning and the looting. And we're seeing that reality because people, we're animals, we're supposed to be higher beings as well, but when you put people in certain situations, their animalistic, you know, response is going to come out. 
And increasingly, we look at antisocial behavior, and we think that this is something we can engineer with behavior change programs, but it doesn't quite work that way. I agree with what Mr. Lou said about you know providing not just houses, but homes and communities, and we're not seeing a lot of that. And the other thing I wanted to just say is we've got to find a way where we're not just building hurricane or earthquake resilient or resistant um, structures. We have to build climate resistant structures. So taking all of those you know, um, elements into account. So we can't say, oh yeah, you're gonna build and then just put on an AC. I mean, you know, we also have a very high energy cost in Jamaica. So you know, air conditioning is a short term. It's a very, very short term solution, right? So we have to start building with better ventilation and we have to take a lot of different elements into account. Yes, I see you. Yes. So thank you, thank you yes. very much. Um, um, hello, I just want to commend Dr. Clark on his research at St. Augustine. And um, I just wondered, and want to bring to the discussion the, um, the development of our Caribbean, not just Jamaican, architectural heritage. Because these buildings have, over the years, become resilient buildings. And they have actually been more sustainable than a lot of the buildings that we're now doing. So they have been designed because they have developed traditionally to resist earthquake the timber frame buildings, the laws were changed after the 1907 earthquake in Jamaica. They are also resistant to hurricanes and so on. So the shape of the roof and everything that is being projected on here is really based on traditional principles and practice of generations of centuries of the Caribbean withstanding hurricanes and earthquakes. So I just wanted to know if in the research that was being done, Dr. Clark, in St. Augustine, if any analysis was looking, was done on the traditional construction and our heritage within the, the, the Caribbean to, s to advise and inform some of his, his solutions. Thank you. Uh, it was a very interesting question, very pertinent. And I'm glad to inform you that yes, we are aware of the need to preserve our historic and heritage buildings and other structures across the Caribbean. Uh, towards that end, there is some research work that has gone in the department through at least one research student looking at the various forms of church construction focusing at first on Island um, Table, but with an intention to go across the entire Caribbean and focus on the, the unique aspects of church construction going back hundreds of years, uh, unique in terms of the materials that would have been used, particularly as substitutes for what, have been, what would have been available in Europe where the original designs were done. Secondly, there have been that going on in the last 15 years or so. Um, you might have heard of the Red House Project and the Magnificent Seven. Actually, the latest Magnificent Seven to be released was the, the, the White Hall uh, around the Savannah in Port of Spain. There is an emphasis, yes. There is a Focus. There is no legislation towards protecting these these um, buildings in the islands of Diego. But in terms of overall Caribbean awareness, I fully agree, and we have started in the department to focus on that issue. But especially within the context of indigenous materials used as substitutes for these heritage. Time for one last burning question, if there is any. As of September the third. The KSMAC, that's why it's unfortunate they're not here to speak for themselves. The KSMAC now require a person can apply for a building permit for a multifamily project on a piece of land 
in a residential area which had single family homes and the covenants restrict them to single family homes. If that person gets a permit, that person cannot commence construction until the restrictive covenants have been lifted and they prove to the building authority that they have been lifted. So if you are a developer, why would you go and spend money to go and do a design or submit your designs to fire brigade and then KSMAC when you have not lifted the covenants and you have a two year period where you must complete construction. If you fail to do so or you do not complete, you have to pay another fee to revalidate your permit. So the clock is ticking. So you are going to, going to submit when you have lifted the covenants and you might not be able to lift the covenants because the residents who surround your property will object. No, 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 no but as I'm saying to you, it is, that, that is something. What was happening before, you got a permit, you could proceed to construction with the covenant still in force. When you complete construction, then you go to the real estate board, and if you have not lifted your covenants, I know in reality, you don't get your splinter title and you can't sell the units. So we have, that is a victory for the citizens based upon things that occurred on a street off of Jacks Hill Road. You know the, all right? So, your, your requirement for the residents of the Yes, 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 the yes, they have to be. There is a piece of land, there's a piece of land at the corner of Hopefield Avenue, Hopefield Avenue, and Lady Musgrave Road, there's a house that the University College of the West Indies, I think, whoever occupied that house back in so and so, and there's a great move afoot by the Seymour um, Land Citizen Association or Development Group that it should be a green space. The resident next door, he used his rights under law to stop housing development on that site. There were plans to build four-story apartments. Apartments on level one and two, level three and four had an internal stair, and the apartments were so designed that they looked into his property and he lost his privacy. So he wanted that, so the covenants could not be lifted because he objected. The gentleman is no longer with us. It is, it is to be seen whether something will occur. But I, th I, I would ask you to look carefully at developments along Lady Musgrave Road. Wherever there's a sewer line, the densities have been increased dramatically. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we really have to wrap interesting though the discussion is. So let me just say thank you as part of the wrap up. First of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Jamaica National General Insurance and UWI TV. Also, uh, Mona Information Technology Services, which provided the, the IT assistance. Mona Visitors Lodge, who hosted us, or caterers, k and caterers. And I won't forget our internal team, Ms. Nadine Sherlock and Ms. Christina Doherty, both of whom have worked very hard on this. Mm. Of course, I'd also like to thank our panelists who have provided the expertise and the very interesting presentations. Um, for your information, you know that UWI TV will be broadcasting this within the next couple of weeks. We're going to put it up as well as on our YouTube channel. I will, we will send you the links by email along with the other documentation. And if the presenters have no objections, we could also circulate the presentations, the PowerPoint presentations which we have. So you'll have a little information packet um, which you can use going forward. Now, my final thank you, of course, is to the audience, without which this would not have taken place. So give yourselves a clap. And thank you for your interest and for staying here.